Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera. It's late Friday afternoon at Aoyama Park next to Tokyo National Art Center. I'm making the video rather late today because actually it's quieter at this time of day than it is earlier when it's hotter and there are more cicadas out and about screaming and making all the noise. There's still quite a few of them around me right now as you can tell by the sound and also the sound of uh, airliners passing overhead. And when I tried to make this video earlier, a helicopter decided to come by and land at Hardy Army Barracks, which is about 250 feet behind where I have my camera set up. Uh, normally, uh, Tokyo is uh, a noisy city at any hour of the day, but uh, uh, sometimes it's much more noisy than uh, usual. The no noisiest time on record was the last time uh, President Trump from America came here to visit Tokyo. He arrived in his uh, Marine One helicopter, and uh, identical duplicate helicopter, a decoy or whatever, which uh, flew in front of it, along with the escort helicopters. And they were, of course, escorted by every available helicopter in all of Japan. So uh, there were helicopters all over the city making all kinds of racket. It reminded me of that Star Wars movie, Return of the Jedi, when the Emperor is coming to supervise the final construction of the new Death Star. And all of the uh, TIE fighters are like orbiting in front of the Death Star in like some kind of formation or salute or whatever. That's what Tokyo is like when uh, President Trump comes here. Uh, when Prime Minister Abe is moving around the city, there isn't much drama. Uh, if he's uh, traveling officially, he has a motorcade of about five cars, and then there's a helicopter flying high enough overhead that you don't really hear it. But most of the time he just travels in a single car and uh, uh, without much drama and uh, it's kind of thoughtful for him because traffic and getting around in Tokyo is bad enough uh, without them shutting down the streets to, uh, to let his and his motorcade you know, travel around. But anyway, uh, I'm hoping it'll quiet down soon. It's getting later, darker, cooler, and these guys have to get tired of making all this noise all day. So hopefully they'll shut up and go to bed soon. So let's go ahead and get started on the subject of today's video. It's going to be another Olympus camera and one of the old ones. Today's video is going to be about the Olympus 35 4B, which was part of the early Olympus 35 series, which uh, was introduced in the late, late 1940s with uh, Olympus 35 1. Uh, the 35 1 was quite similar in appearance to this camera, the later ones, except that it had kind of this odd looking metal. Uh, thing on the side, uh, which in Japan people thought made it look like those uh, uh, good luck cat statues which you find at the tourist shops around Asaka and stuff like that. So they called that camera the cat's paw camera. Olympus uh, called it the pickpocket camera because they said you could take it out of your pocket and get a photograph about as quickly as a pickpocket could steal your wallet. Uh, Japan is one of those places where uh, pickpockets are unheard of, so uh, here in Japan no one really has any idea how long it takes a pickpocket to pick someone's pocket, so uh, they kind of stick with the term uh, cat's paw. Uh, it's quite a simple camera as you can see, uh, pretty much everything is on the outside of the camera, there isn't much internal to it at all, whereas the later cameras pretty much everything is located on the inside of the camera. Now the good thing about having everything on the outside is the camera is easier to assemble and maintain and it's a lot easier to find the controls and to understand how the camera works. We'll go ahead and start at the top of the camera uh, showing you the details and controls and everything. Uh, we'll take a look first at the rewind knob which pops up so you can lift it over the flash shoe. The flash shoe is actually quite a high quality shoe with a couple of uh, check balls with springs in them to work as kind of like detents to hold in the flash. It's much smoother and locks better than the, the friction system used on most other cameras. When you attach a flash gun or strobe flash to the Olympus 35, you will find the flash sink located here on the bottom. Uh, the Olympus 35 is a scale focus camera, not the range finder, so it just has a simple viewfinder system located right on the top in the middle. Next to that we have a three-way selector switch and this is a, the switch for uh, the film winding mechanism and the release mechanism. When you're operating the camera you would set the switch to the A setting and uh, each time you wind the camera you have to charge the shutter and then take a photograph. Uh, for taking a double exposures or multiple exposures you will set it to the D and this allows you to charge the shutter and take photos without winding the film. 
and when you push it all the way over to the R, that's to release the winding mechanism and to allow you to rewind the film. To the far side here, of course, we have the film winding knob and the counter dial located underneath. When you load film in the camera, you will reset the dial to the zero setting using the two pins on either side to help you turn the dial and then the camera is good to go. On the bottom of the camera we have a release knob which allows you to release the latch and take off the film back. This camera is somewhat of an oddity. It's a 4B which makes it a, a later production camera but it seems to have a glass pressure plate in the back which was something which normally came on the earlier cameras and which they discontinued because uh, the winding the film over the glass created static electricity and sometimes it would discharge and it would leave you know, like miniature flashes of lightning or marks on your film. So uh, Olympus used these only for a short time and then switched over to metal pressure plates. From the looks of it, this one seems to be like a combination of metal and glass. Uh, it's the first time I've seen one of these. Uh, maybe it's uncommon, maybe it isn't. But I, I don't come across a lot of these cameras, so I'm not the big authority on the film pressure plates. Moving to the front of the camera, we have the lens assembly and all the important features. The main feature of the Olympus 35 .1 is an outstanding 40mm f3.5 lens. It's an f Zuiko lens and the number uh, denotes the number of, or excuse me, the letter denotes the number of elements in the lens. So F would be the sixth letter of the alphabet, so that means this lens has six elements in it. Uh, cameras like the Olympus OM with the 50 millimeter lens, it usually has like a G Zuiko lens, uh, so it would have something, I guess that's seven elements. And then we have cameras like the Olympus Wide with the 35 millimeter F2H Zuiko lens, which has eight elements. So a kind of interesting thing. And of course, Olympus' uh, most popular lens was its D Zuiko in the PIN series, which was a simple four element lens. Uh, we have the controls here on the lens itself. The very first ring in the front is the focusing ring, which here is an indicator showing uh, in feet. And so, of course, we have infinity and then a red mark for 2.4 feet, which is what, uh, I guess, popular for taking portraits and so on and so on. Uh, behind that, we have the uh, shutter speed ring. And being this is a 4B, it has a shutter, maximum shutter speed of 1 500th of a second. The 4A topped out at 1 300th of a second, and the earlier models topped out at 1 200th of a second. Of course, we have the shutter charging uh, lever here, which you have to charge every time you fire the shutter. And at the very back, we have the uh, aperture selection ring. And right here, uh, in front of the shutter speed ring, we have a simple depth of field gauge. So we have a lot of depth of field with this camera, so even though it's not a rangefinder, you still can get a pretty accurate focus, even if you aren't especially accurate in your focusing. So quite a good camera to take uh, uh, precise photos of, even though it's a scale focus camera. Now, overall, these are quite uh, incredibly well-made and reliable cameras, and I find these to be better made and a little bit more, more reliable than later uh, 35 cameras which came out, the, namely the S series, uh, which came out in the 1950s. Uh, these were not highly regarded in Japan, and even today they don't have much value here. Uh, I've come across uh, quite a few of the, the 35s, and I like the lens. I like the 40 mil 45 millimeter F2 lens, or 42 millimeter uh, F2 or F1.9, F1.8 lens, but they just never caught on in Japan, and they still haven't caught on today. The only exception is the later 35 wide with the 35 millimeter uh, F2 lens. Now that one uh, is quite popular in Japan because a lot of people say that uh, this H Zuiko lens performs as well as the 35-2 Leica Summicron lens, and you can get. Uh, quite a few of these cameras with this lens for less than the cost of a so-so Leica 35 uh, F2 Summicron. Uh, these are quite a, an interesting camera and if you are interested in learning the nuts and bolts and basic of uh, photography, a camera like this is quite good. There are no electronics, no batteries, no nothing. Everything is uh, simply uh, uh, fully manual. It's quite easy to use one of these cameras once you get the hang of it, and uh, as most of us carry smartphones nowadays, uh, you can simply download a light meter app to your smartphone, 
and program the film speed into your app uh, which, to match the film uh, that you have loaded in the camera. And then you can use your phone to uh, suggest the settings that you use for uh, making the exposures. So really not that hard to use. But anyway, it's getting late, it's getting dark, and it's not getting any quieter here, so I'm going to go ahead and stop. Uh, I'll be posting this camera for sale later tonight on my uh, Etsy and eBay stores and my new online store, japanvintagecamera.com. If you're interested in buying this uh, camera or another vintage Japanese camera, uh, please visit my stores. I'll post links to my stores in the description below the video. I'll be posting more videos about vintage Japanese cameras and other cameras, photography in Japan, and related subjects in the future. If you'd like to see these, please subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.